Welcome back. And this just in that uh, the um, Russian Prime Minister Medvedev has just announced that the Russian government has collectively resigned. We uh, do not have much information at this moment, but we'll bring them to you as soon as more information becomes available. Please follow CGTN for the very latest. And we continue on this edition of The Point, and we're going to discuss AI and AI talents. A thriving economy should not only maximize the productivity of its workers, but to nurture their talents, especially to lead a cutting-edge industry like artificial intelligence. So with China now at the forefront of AI innovation, how well is the country cultivating and retaining its homegrown talent? What more needs to be done? Joining me for the discussion in the Beijing studio is Zhang Fan, Associate Professor at the Beijing Normal University, and from Geneva, from Geneva Bruno Lanvan, the Executive Director of Global Indices, or GTCI, at the uh, INSEAD Business School. Mr. Lanvan is also co-editor of the annual Global Ta Talent Competitiveness Index, which will soon be releasing its 2020 rankings. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. So let me go to you first, Mr. Lanvan. According to the GTCI, Talent is not only a top priority for companies, but for countries and cities, of course. And uh, the GDCI authors assert that how well this talent performs is clearly seen as key to growth, job creation, and innovation. The three main challenges each country faces is how to grow, attract, and retain talent. So Mr. Lan Van, as co-editor of the index, how are these three qualities, why are these three qualities so crucial today? Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it has been said that uh, data was the new oil. One could say that talent is the new air. And uh, the combination of data and talent is crucial in AI and in other areas. But for all areas where countries compete with each other, talent is becoming the ultimate resource. Uh, China has been a remarkable example in that uh, sense uh, because from uh, an average uh, ranking of 45 six years ago, it is now on an average ranking on a moving average basis of 39, which shows uh, significant progress in that area. Uh, all countries, cities and companies will have to rely on talent which is increasingly mobile internationally. So competing for talent is about attracting and retaining uh, the most talented individuals and teams uh, in areas as crucial as innovation generally mm -hmm. or AI in particular. Very interesting numbers you have given there. So China uh, has been climbing from around 45 uh, places to something like 39. Um, Mr. Lanvan, would you highlight some of the key reasons that you believe must have enabled China to have climb, climbed up in a, in a span of just a few years in terms of uh, its talent performance? Definitely. The model, the GTCI model, which has now been in existence for uh, more than seven years, relies on seven pillars. Out of these seven pillars, China performs very highly in two, uh, namely growing talent and what we call the global knowledge skills, for which it is in the first quartile among the, the countries in the world, the top 25%. And this is due to mainly two things. One is the high quality of the formal education system. Uh, students coming out of primary school, the secondary schools in China come out with a very solid knowledge base. The other one is the emphasis that has been put by the government, but also by universities, by different organizations on innovation. Innovation is seen as a critical part of national strategy and the combination of a good education system and uh, accent on innovation mm -hmm. is leading to a high level of talent competitiveness. Mm. Professor Zhang, I'm going to go to you here because you grew up in China, right? You are one living case of uh, Chinese talent. On the other hand, you're also teaching in universities, cultivating more talents. But you've also worked in the United States. You've also studied in the United States. What's your personal experience comparing these two different uh, systems or structures of cultivating talent and attracting talent? Uh, so it used to be pretty hard for China to attract 
Thailand because it used to be a really poor country and the U.S. is a really rich country, so the brain drain is, is definitely that way. Uh, but things are, are, are getting uh, quite a bit better nowadays. Uh, in terms of training talent, uh, so China's basic education system is more egalitarian. Uh, so engineering talent, there are lots and lots of really good engineers. So the, the average training for engineers is pretty good. In the U.S. and I was actually also in the U.K. Um, so in these countries, they have more elitist uh, education. They have really, really good top layer people. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the the next up level uh, it is a bit lacking. So so that's the that's the that's the main difference. Uh, yeah. China okay. pretty good. So. All right. Uh, Mr. Longvan, um, Professor Zhang just now talked about a brain drain, which used to be really severe. Uh, what is the situation right now? Does your index examine that trend and uh, the possible factors influencing the movement of that trend? Definitely. Um, this is something we devote uh, critical attention to. Um, 2017 was a very important year for China. This is the, the year where the number of foreign students studying in China started to be higher than the number of Chinese students studying abroad. Uh, this shows that um, not only the level of local universities and schools has increased enough to attract students from other parts of the world, but also that individuals are seeing an increasing value in gaining some kind of Chinese experience, whether it is as students or as professionals. And we don't believe in the notion of brain drain or even brain gain as became fashionable in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. We believe in the concept of what we call brain circulation. That is that for any government, any company, any group, it is important to have individuals who have a variety of experiences, who are citizens of the world, who know how to do business in the US, in Europe, in China, and you cannot learn that unless you have been living in those environments. Where? So that notion of brain circulation is becoming yeah. key. Where is China standing in terms of uh, that notion, the brain circulation? Is China a place where a lot of brains would like to travel through at least? Or is China a place where people say we want to avoid at least for now? Mr. Longman. Well, the, uh, there is a checkered uh, picture there. <coughs> On one hand, we see an increasing number of Chinese uh, citizens who uh, have a good command of English. So that equips them to uh, become potential students in other countries, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, but the, the dominant, uh, of course, national language in China remains Chinese, uh, Mandarin. So, uh, so the ability of foreigners to acquire that, that language mm -hmm. is also limited, and it limits the number of potential brain circulation in that sense. But altogether, the degree of openness uh, of an economy, of a society, is critically important to its success in innovation generally. Mm -hmm. So that will be something on which China uh, will have to pursue its effort, being okay. seen as an open economy. Right. Um, Professor Zhang, again, your observation of uh, the brain circulation, how, how, how much do you align with this description and uh, uh, the potential obstacles, the language barrier that China faces at this moment? Well, I fully agree with the circulation idea. I mean, yours truly is, is, is circulated all the way around the world uh, and, and came back. And I gained so much just by, uh, just by not, not, not just from the, uh, the scientific point of view, you know, different, uh, different universities actually teach different things, uh, just quantum physics in, in the UK, because people contribute, in, in these different institutions contribute to different things, and they actually teach you different things, and then you start to learn how ideas develop and that sort of things. And um, in terms of uh, language barrier, yes, my collaborators, when they come to China, what Chinese people don't uh, fully appreciate it is when they see the Chinese characters and they can't guess 
Um, if they go into a different European country, uh, they can still guess sort of what it, what it means. But when they see Chinese character, it's, it's a, a shock. totally different system. And then they don't have bank accounts. They don't have WeChat and, 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 and whatever to, to, to just right. do the daily things. And those things really need to uh, okay. be improved. Things are changing, though. I understand things are changing f to facilitate um, short-term visits by foreigners, for instance, or even longer term, although it's still going to take uh, a little bit of a process. Um, Mr. Longman, I still have a little bit of time, and we need to touch on the issue of artificial intelligence, because that's what, what set off this topic. What do you think China's strengths and weakness is at this moment in terms of attracting or cultivating uh, talents in the artificial intelligence sector? China is clearly seen right now as a leader in artificial intelligence. So that by itself is a magnet. Talent want to know uh, what China is doing in artificial intelligence. They want to be associated to successful ventures in artificial intelligence. Uh, AI is an area where China has a massive advantage over many other economies around the world, which is the data advantage. That is the quantity of data collected uh, in China through different means. It can be IoT, it can be different uh, channels, is massive and much higher than what is collected in uh, other parts of the, of the world. So that in itself allows uh, machine learning, it allows AI to feed uh, on itself and to grow. Um, one must keep in mind regarding talent that the talent we're talking about uh, regarding AI is uh, very specific. Uh, on one hand, it is high-level talent. On the other hand, it is multifaceted. It is very difficult to imagine today that you would train someone in AI. What you would need is neuroscientists, mathematicians, programmers, all of them with a specialization in AI, but it's mm -hmm. only through the combination of their talent that AI will be truly innovative and productive. All right. So the policy around talent around AI has to be multifaceted. Okay, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to uh, Mr. Bruno Lanvan, the Executive Director of the Global Indices uh, of, of the Global Indices or GTCI at INSEAD Business School, joining us from Geneva. And many thanks to Zhang Fan from Beijing Normal University. Once again, the Russian government has resigned, and uh, uh, after President Vladimir Putin proposed a series of constitutional reforms and Russian news agencies have reported. Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said the proposals would make significant changes to the country's balance of power and so the government in its current form has resigned. Uh, stay with the CGTN for, very, for the very latest. You have been watching The Point. Thanks for joining us and uh, you're always welcome to join us on Facebook and Twitter via the handle The Point with Alex. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.